Good morning. Thank you all for coming to this second day of our wonderful celebration. We have a full and exciting program today. We're going to start with uh, Munzer Dahle. So Munzer got his PhD from Rice University and then joined MIT right after that. I believe it was 1987. So Munzer started by working on uh, L1 control, then moved into robust control. He's done lots of work on uh, fundamental work on control theory, identification, then moving on to large and more and more complex systems. Uh, he's the only person I know, I don't know if there are others, but he has received the George Axelby Best Paper Award four times. I don't know if others have succeeded in that. And I guess since uh, he likes to do more and more complicated things, eventually he got into the really complicated stuff, which is he's been Leeds Director, ECS Associate Department Head, and his biggest thing was that he was the key person that launched the MIT Institute for Data Systems and Society. Really challenging work, but uh, that has given great fruits. As I mentioned yesterday, there has been a great synergy between Leeds and IDSS with uh, both entities helping each other in its mission. The missions are highly correlated, but also not completely identical, but it has all worked extremely well for Leeds. So Munzer is going to tell us more about IDSS and the landscape. Thank you, John, uh, and thanks for the CV. I, I noticed yesterday Dave said that uh, uh, the depth of your work is inversely proportional to the application. I'm happy to tell you all that my work has not been applied, so I think it's really deep. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I thought I'd make some remarks today about um, the, you know, the, the leadership and the role that Lids played in the launching of IDSS and why we launched IDSS. Um, and uh, give you some kind of perspective. So to start out with, I wanted to say something about computing and kind of my view of how computing has evolved in the, in the maybe last 40 or 50 years. And obviously, we heard yesterday the, the role that LIDS has played in, in computing. So you know, maybe about 40, 50 years ago, we were thinking about these large frames. We saw that the first analog computers were actually developed in, at LIDS. But the mainframes, high powerful computers at that time were extremely important for us to understand how to simulate and, 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 and kind of uh, get a perspective on very high dimensional systems, you know, climate systems, air traffic systems, and so forth. And that was extremely valuable and that lasted for many, many years until a new infrastructure got created where Blitz played a very, very important role, and that is the cellular phones and the mobile communication. Mobile communication has changed the way we operate, in fact, but not only that, it allowed us to collect enormous amount of data about people. Slowly by slowly, this data has evolved into systems, social systems, and connectivity and interaction between groups and so forth that actually brought a new dimension to the kind of work that we can be doing, which is understanding how these uh, social systems evolve and how they interact with physical systems. And the holy grail moving forward is the embedding of these uh, intelligent, powerful devices in physical systems where not only they're doing a lot of processing, but they're enabling us to, to provide decisions. So the decision making is happening in real time. Systems are collecting data providing insight and real-time decisions are being made. And obviously, we heard and we will hear today about the role that LITS is playing in a lot of this stuff. It's my view that even though the data analysis and the inference and machine learning and artificial intelligence is all very important from an abstract point of view, at some point, it's going to be the embedding of that technology in domains that's going to make a huge difference. And it's really that physical embedding that's going to make um, um, sort of the revolution of the future. So the examples of that are many. Uh, transportation systems are one example of physical infrastructures that have, are no longer about building highways and bridges and entirely about informatics. How can you handle the information that you have? Cities are trying to provide, make sure that their data is available for, for uh, vendors and people to 
figure out ways in which you can increase the efficiency of the city. But of course, as more devices are coming in and they're not coordinated, um, we're seeing more and more congestion. Of course, congestion is also caused by the increased demand to go into these cities. You can have a lot of interesting examples where Waze and Google, even though they sort of provide every person with the state of the universe to make a decision of where to go and so forth, actually are causing more congestions elsewhere because of diverting the traffic into areas that are not thought about. And this is actually the kind of thing that we sort of seeing right now, technology coming in, uncoordinated, creating a lot of chaos, but I, th I think with the perception that we're actually engaged and doing well with that system. So how can that, all of that change? Um, the power grid is another infrastructure that is becoming uh, extremely fragile. Um, um, today, we don't think about it. When you wake up in the morning, you turn on the lights, the lights turn on, you think everything is okay. But in fact, if you think about the next, um, 20 years, maybe, I'm hearing 2025, many of the companies are only going to produce electric cars. Well, if we get 30% penetration of cars in the United States, 10% penetration in Cambridge, Cambridge system will break down. Um, you know, we don't have the infrastructure to support that kind of uh, charging, and so the question is how do we manage that? Well, we can increase the capacity, or we can increase the, the production of electricity, or we can do better management of the electricity that we have. And one of the beautiful things about electric cars is that they come with, um, with the solution. They come with the batteries. And so the battery is a, is a wonderful storage component, but it's a distributed small storage component everywhere. Brings up the question, can that distributed capability be integrated in such a way that we can actually resolve the problem that is created entirely by the demand on the grid and so forth. So again, that's, a, that's another aspect of the problem. One well, interesting thing about the power grid, and I always joke about this now, is that it used to be that we explained the internet by making some similarities to how the power, the power grid works. Now we explain the power grid as soon as by explaining how the internet works. Well, one thing about the internet is, of course, you can drop packets, but you cannot drop cities. It's a little hard. You know, that's when you get outages. Um, but that's one thing about this particular system that is actually fascinating is that it's not only about the complex engineering system, it's also about the people engaging it, it's about the economics of the markets that are all running in, essentially in real time, and, and it's a very complicated thing to sort of, um, it, it's a complex system that is not easy to understand. I won't talk about the financial systems, it's a depressing subject, it goes up, comes down, but at the same time, it's just wanted to say that the financial system is another example which we, also can think about entirely in the same way. There are protocols and there's a system in place, but there's also very fast engagement of people with that system that can actually drive it to instability, systemic risk and cascaded failures are one thing that could be caused by wrong signaling. And so an important area also to, to think about in terms of these examples where the embedded, the embedded decision and uh, information and decision systems in these kind of physical systems will become really critical and important. We, of course, saw that uh, voting um, and political systems are one other example that has been impacted by the, again, what I would say, mobile devices that allow you to measure the state of the system and then react to it. Uh, I would say in the previous election, we discovered that polling was a very interesting way of moving people's opinions and creating some clusters of thinking um, by, by sort of advertising, you know, who's popular now and who's winning now, and, and you're getting all this information in real time. And it actually had some really interesting impact um, on how people were thinking. And finally, I just want to end with this example, which is the misinformation. And <laughs> misinformation is one area where it's become a, a real problem for, for people to understand or discern, you know, what's, what's right and what's not right. Uh, we thought that we democratize information with the internet, but in fact what is happening, we're creating a lot of bubbles. People access the data that they want to access. They read the articles that their friends post. Um, and so, but it's not a question of just kind of building a, a, an intelligence system that will, will try to cluster information. It's really about infrastructure and it's about platforms. Can you create the right platform for which this information is being checked and aggregated in the right way. And there's a lot of thinking that is going into this area that brings in the social aspect of 
misinformation because as we all know, you know, news has never been about right or wrong and it's a lot of, for many, many years, it's been a, a spectrum of, of truth. However, I think, you know, we always thought about the source, we always try to understand where this information comes from, what are the platforms that can support this kind of a thinking. So, the, the sort of the thing that I'm trying to lead to and, and kind of progression of uh, the LITS event is that in many, many years, and for me in particular, I would say, I spend a lot of my life in this side, you know, physical and engineered systems. I never thought about people. You know, you design a control system and you, you have a sp performance specifications of what the, what the airplane should do and the pitch dynamics and so forth. People were not mentioned then. Once in a while, people will talk about the human in the loop and they meant one person. You know, at the same time, there were parallel people at MIT and elsewhere in the world who were thinking about people and thinking about institutions and markets and so forth. And we separate, we were separate from each other and we worked independently of each other. And then at some point we met with the, in the real application. Now it's a little different, and the, re the reason it's different is that the society now has connected the two pieces entirely because of the technology that we have. The mobile phone that you have right now brings every person to the state of the universe today. So the social behavior impacts the physical system and the physical system impacts the social behavior. Markets and incentives and pricing and so forth are all coupled into the process to try to regulate this thinking. The time scale changed. Everything is running in real time. And then the thinking about how you design such systems have to come in real time. That was one of the questions that was asked yesterday in the panel. How do we deal with this? How do we bring real time uh, dynamical systems and physical system with the real time reaction of people and how do we build the economic and the institutions around it to make it work. It's not that trivial, this is a very complicated system, but that is exactly the thing that sort of got us to start thinking about, so where do we go next? So this is kind of another uh, picture of the one that John showed, this little, drawn a little differently. All the examples that I showed you have the interaction of these three components that I just described, the physical systems, and by that I mean you know, things like physics and biology and where we have mechanistic models and we understand where they come from, protocols even, and, and so forth. They interact with people, these interact with institution, and this loop runs in a, in a sort of a real-time situation. So it's real-time or almost real-time. And so this is a complex problem and as I said, it's a new problem because of the real-time aspect of it. In the past, it was always existed, but it was a low, much slower scale that we were able to separate these systems uh, and work on them um, without the interaction. So how do we address this problem? We want to do the same thing that we learned yesterday and we're going to talk about today. We need to understand what are the right abstractions that will capture the different components. How do we develop insights with these abstractions? Okay, and I, you know, in some ways, that's exactly what engineering and what sort of system theory and, and information theory and all of these fields have tried to do, abstract the complex problems and then try to come with, with, with insights of how to design them and how to analyze them and so forth. One thing that has become obviously important and essential for doing something interesting in this area is the fact that now we have and we are collecting a lot of data about these systems. The fact that we're collecting data about these systems doesn't mean that we solve this problem, right? Data is data, and this data is actually very complex. It's very heterogeneous. Data from Kirchhoff laws is very different from what we measure in terms of human behavior and social behavior, and it's very, very different from uh, tracking uh, electricity prices and trying to understand the incentive mechanisms and what happens in institutions. These are extremely different heterogeneous data sets. Uh, they're they maybe sometimes not linked, which is a problem, but that's, a, that's more of a technicality, but you know, and, and most of the time the data that you want you can't get, and that's a very important component. If you think about financial systems, you're trying to understand cascaded failure, um, the data that you want to understand the cascaded failure is not data that they will give you. And so you have to, data is great, but data is not yet the answer. And when, one thing that we do not mean in trying to understand these systems is to say, okay, great, you know, we developed engineering models. Should I don't know how to go back here this way? We developed engineering models. 
There are some social networks over here, and there are, you know, general equilibrium theory over there. Let's just put them all together and simulate. That is not what we're proposing. That is not what needs to be done. What needs to be done is the right set of abstractions, which obviously have to be done in the context of a domain, in the context of a problem, and the creativity of many of the students and researchers that have thought about problems like this before and figured out how to, how to um, analyze them and, and, and provide the insights that we're looking for. Needless to say, of course, we are recognizing right now that data has become a, a, an extremely important commodity. Okay, and it's something that you know, was alluded to several times in the, in the talks yesterday is that what's gonna happen is that these real-time systems are, are going to be demanding data as they're operating, and they're going to be demanding this data in real time. And there's no place to go get this data from. It's a commodity that you cannot sell. There's no place to buy it from. And I think that this is one of the areas where communities are trying to think about. How do you think about data as a commodity independently of these systems? So creating new thinking, new economics, new ways of evaluating what's important in the control and decision, or, or at least the, the sort of understanding of, of, any of any interesting infrastructure or problem that has these components in it. And that's what happened. Let's recognize this outreach. Let's faculty uh, talked a lot about connecting with the social sciences through social networks and thinking of the sort with economists and thinking about markets. Of course, Litz has always had uh, domain expertise from, from engineering, uh, electrical engineering, uh, aeronautical and astronautical engineering, mechanical engineering, civil engineering, and so, and so Litz was in the prime place to start thinking about how can we broaden the agenda to address these types of problems in the way Litz addresses these problems. So IDSS was formed with Litz being the core competency of IDSS, uh, of IDSS the faculty of um, LITS were an integral part of, uh, of IDSS, and IDSS took off to try to expand uh, the reach in terms of hiring faculty, creating a academic programs, and, and, and sort of robustifying this sort of uh, question of how do we go from these complicated systems into a design and insight. Uh, so the three areas, data systems and society, are pretty broad. It's almost everything, so, but we do think of it in a, in a little bit more um, focused way, so certainly in order to address research and academics in this area, information and decision systems and sciences are an integral part. This is where information theory, control theory, system theory, signal processing, um, optimization, all of that stuff lies. MIT has always been extremely strong in this area and LITS has always been a core in this area. The second component that's needed was statistics because the data has been such a critical part of this. That's an, an area that I'll come back to, something that MIT struggled with. And the third piece that had to be brought in is what I call human institutional behavior, aspects of social sciences that are interested in the integration or understanding how people respond to incentives, how people create or change behavior because of interaction with systems, and you had to do this in, in the context of a domain knowledge. The story with the statistics, of course, as John alluded to, uh, before MIT never had a department of statistics, but had a lot of attempts to do that. Um, 40 years ago, MIT hired uh, Chernoff uh, to create a department of statistics in, the, in, in mathematics. Um, Chernoff uh, went off and hired um, at least two junior faculty. Um, and, and the two junior faculty did not get tenure. Chernoff was hired with tenure, but the two junior faculty didn't get tenure, and so Chernoff got very upset, left to Harvard, and cast a spell on MIT that will never have statistics. <laughs> but I think what happened is that Litz and the Litz faculty brought in um, uh, a lot of statisticians who existed on campus. You know, we, MIT had statisticians but didn't have an institution. We brought them in. And uh, we created an effort, what we call 21st century statistics, not the 19th century statistics, one that worries about high dimensionality, uh, uncertainty, uh, rare events, uh, things that are important and relevant, and uh, real time, online, and so forth, things that are important and relevant to the types of questions that I asked you. And as John mentioned, uh, this is a thriving effort right now within LIDS and IDSS, and we're very proud of what we've done. But, <laughs> 
as I said, not, it's not only that, but it's only also bringing all of these uh, components together. Um, the new College of Computing now that LITS will sit in uh, is actually has a th part of its mission, the connection to society, aligned with the IDSS mission, which is the connection to society. And as a result, uh, the College of Computing will provide IDSS with even more resources to expand this vision into, into social sciences. So we're very you know, happy and excited to make this work and actually expand the story, but I would say still around the thinking and the core competency that pro was provided by LIDS, which is you want to do these problems in, a, in an abstracted, systematic way, rigorous analysis of these problems that can then develop insights. So I won't spend too much time on these things. We created programs. You can see them on our website. I'll just uh, go through that. So I'm going to go back and say that the story is going to remain the same for us, but the application and the context is different, as Ben Van Roy said yesterday. The context is different. The context today is these sort of embedded devices, fast computing that you can use for collecting data, but also to help you develop decisions. But we still have the real world, and the real world provides us with the data, our faculty develop the models and inference that then we do the, that we build and then we develop the insights through optimization and decision. These insights ultimately come back and drive the real world and the cycle continues. This is the, I changed my colors to be the honey colors that uh, John mentioned yesterday. This is where our work has been, it hasn't changed. The only difference is now that the models are of things that are much more complicated than what we had to deal with, they involve human components, they involve institutions, and not obvious abstractions of how to go from these problems to, to from these kind of descriptions to formulations. So I wanna say that, um, you know, LITS survived 80 years because LITS was able to reinvent itself in, in different opportunities. You don't do the same thing for 80 years and survive. And that management to reinvent itself, still maintaining rigor, has been the key component of why that survived, and I, and I, and I, and you know, it's the oldest lab at MIT for 80 years. It's impressive, and uh, I would say that the directors that have led LIDS have maintained that same idea. You know, we 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 will adjust to the world, we reinvent ourselves, and we maintain our our rigor. So, for the transition to IDSS, LIDS recognized, for example, that a huge component is to build statistics and machine learning into into LIDS, and this uh, hiring and sort of bringing the right set of people has been instrumental in, in building that effort, but also they, you know, both uh, Sanjoy and uh, Alan uh, were inspirational in this transition, maintaining that we, we stay strong to our core, but we actually keep looking at where the applications are and what are the things that are gonna make a difference, and I think we steered that ship in that direction, and I have a feeling that LITS is gonna to continue to flourish, and John is gonna have a celebration in the next 10 years, and it's gonna be as wonderful as it was yesterday. Um, and I do wanna acknowledge that this doesn't happen with one or two people, it was a collective effort, everybody came together, but certainly, specific leaders have showed us a lot of effort, and I would want to single out John, and I say John has steered LIDS in the last uh, three years in, in directions that, uh, you know, today we doubled the number of PIs. Our volume is incredible. Those are just numbers. But in, in terms of the signature, LIDS continues to do fundamental research in new areas and in new directions, but maintaining kind of the same quality that, has, that we've seen in front of us, you know, for the last day, and we're going to see it today. So it's not only that John has done a, an amazing job with the event and a great party yesterday, which also that was great, but also he has maintained an amazing leadership of the lab, and I want to personally thank you for all the effort that you've done. And I